All right, well, let's get this party started. The topic for today is the anatomical abutment. But we're excited about this topic. We're probably going to be anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes. And like always, there is a spot where you can ask questions in the Q&A. And when we get done, we will try to answer those for everyone. So feel free to type any questions in there and uh, we'll answer those at the end, if not during the actual lecture. Um, anatomical abutment. So the agenda, and we're going to be a little dynamic with this, we'll kind of go all over the place, but we want to talk about what is this anatomical abutment? How did it come about? What are some of its advantages? How do you use it? Uh, meaning kind of what are the workflows? How clinically is this going to be implemented? And um, we'll kind of take a, take a thought a walk through that. Maybe dad, you share some um, starting thoughts on this concept of the custom abutment and how we got into this anatomical world and some just generic advantages. You know, as I think back about 30 years, we, we just had a stock abutment. That's all we had. And we'd prep it with a, a carbide burr and then a diamond and polish it and take a, a static impression of it. And the abutment, interesting enough, if it was a four diameter implant, which is when we started, that's all we had, it was a four diameter abutment. So we never had abutment uh, portfolios of four, five, sixes, whatever. So, so the abutment has come a long ways. We have what's called platform switching, which is the relationship of the abutment to the uh, platform of the implant fixture. Then we have abutment switching, meaning the same brand of implant can take many, many different sizes of abutments in a connective uh, process. Today, we're talking about these anatomic abutments and the anatomic abutment has been on the market for a period of a long time. It was just, let's make it a little fancier than a stock abutment. Let's charge the doctors more for it. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you that we've come a long ways and you're going to, you're going to see it. You guys all probably already know it, but you're trying to get some more further details on it. But I want to share with you something that is why I am really passionate about why we're here today with this topic. And it was about 15, 16 years ago, I had a patient and uh, I, I put an implant in a number 14. But while, and, and because of logistics, this patient lived a, a ways away from my office in a different state. I just had this, and this may be 20 years ago or so, long time ago. I had this epiphany of thought. In the middle of the surgery, I thought, why couldn't I? I just put the implant in. I had a flap reflected. Why couldn't I put a transfer abutment in right now? Why couldn't I put my polyether in under the flap? That's a good retraction. That's the epitome of a traction cord. And why couldn't I take a regular closed tray impression? And I did. Then the patient left. I sutured the patient up. The patient healed uneventfully. She came back to the practice about four, five, six months later. And I had a custom abutment made and a PFM crown. For those of you who don't know, PFM means porcelain fused to metal. It was kind of a unique concept way back when. Is that, is that a thing they taught back when you went to dental school? Yeah. Well, no, we didn't even have PFMs when I went to dental school. We had FGs. Those were full gold crowns. That's Interesting. It's, it's, yeah, and they, they look like gold, you know, like, like a, a Like a bling, bling. Bling, bling. Okay. Yeah, you, you younger doctors don't even know, but a PFM, porcelain fused to metal, I had it all fabricated. It went in a box. The pa patient came back and here's the epiphany that occurred and it was magical and I've never forgotten it. I don't want you to forget the message here. So I made a quick incision. There were fresh reedy pegs, meaning I'd made an incision in the connective tissue, keratinized tissue. The reedy pegs of the, of the keratinized tissue were readily available. The abutment was sterile. I put it in, I tightened it to torque, I put a little cotton pellet, that's what we did years ago, cotton pellet, put the crown on, cemented it with the flap reflected, and then cleaned up the cement. That's the epitome of cleaning up cement. I could see that it was all gone. I put a couple of sutures in, patient came back, and I've never before seen a more beautiful outcome. The tissues were robust, the tissues were amazing, they were connected. There was no probable issues. And my brain said, why is this different today than other times? 
because other times we, we uncover, we put a healing abutment in, we let them go, we take the healing abutment out, and then we bring them back, you know, take an impression, put the healing abutment back in, then let them go and bring them back. Before you know it, you've got long junctional epithelium connection. Those reedy pegs are now leather, leather, like, like leather. And, and you can't have any biologic connection when you've got a leather sulcus. And so the biologic width or the mimicry of the biologic width is, is, is not there because we have neglected to be respectful to science. So by doing this case many years ago, the lights went off, lights went on in my brain and I realized, wow, this is amazing. How could I do this again? And I did it again and I saw it again. I did it again and I did it hundreds of times. So I get so excited, Riley, when we look at this anatomic abutment, is this is an abutment that through gathering of data, through artificial intelligence, we've created an abutment that should fit most humans pretty well before the surgery is done. And that is used to facilitate a connection of the biology to the fresh, sterile anatomic abutment that is placed right after the implant's placed. And it's all done virtually ahead of time. The planners do it well, you approve it as the doctor, then you go ahead and you get your guide, you put it on, you do your surgery, but you have the perfect opportunity to recreate a mimic of the biologic width without any creation of leather or pseudo pocket or whatever you wanna call it. I'm gonna call it the facilitator, the leather Pseudo pocket is the facilitator of periimplantitis. I'm not a scientist. I don't study all this stuff. I'm just an observational learner. And someday these really smart guys are going to say PK was right. It is the leather or the lack of attachment or the lack of biologic adhesions that allow the, the propagation of bone loss because we don't have any protection. And hence we get blood that comes out and germs that get in and we got a big mess. So this anatomic abutment, Riley, rocks my world. I've been waiting for it for a long time. I happened upon it. And I know that many of you watching tonight are into this stuff, you get it. I, I, and, and I applaud you for that. It is stable tissue that creates stable bone coupled with stable forces. And you've got a stable everything and no one love stable more than me. Maybe uh, stable, everything is the way to go. I'm not a horse, but I, I do like stable. Stable, <laughs> not stable, like stables, but you know what I'm saying. So I think- <laughs> we, I can always tell when I embarrass you, you just kind of make this funny little look and go, I'm just, just trying, weirdo. I'm just, just weirdo. put the dots together. Riley, oh. I felt it telepathically through my computer. You were embarrassed for just a second. You want to make it shut up, huh? Just proud. Hey, no. I'm on my boat. I'm in my happy place. I can say anything I want. This is true. All right. Well, here's the reality. You've been talking about this for well over 10 years, I would say. And well, I've been talking about it for a long time, probably because I got Alzheimer's. I can't remember what I've said, but it's important. That, that could be it. Reset. Yes. But the point is some companies are starting to talk about this concept of muco integration. We all know the osseo integration, getting the implant and the bone to marry with one another. But now if we can get the soft tissue to somehow marry or connect with whatever transmucosal material is put there, um, then like you say, we have this seal, this biologic seal, this biologic width, which is gonna prevent the, you know, the travel of bacteria, blood and so forth. And so this abutment is gonna help facilitate that in addition to just some neat clinical pearls. And like PK mentioned, Basically, they took a bunch of custom abutments, thousands and thousands, analyzed them with some AI technology and came up with some geometries that are very similar to averages across thousands of custom abutments based on tooth physics. So if you look on the right, there's an upper incisor, a lower incisor, canine, premolar, and molar anatomical abutment. Now, more and more are going to be coming out as there's more AI technology um, being utilized to analyze custom abutment designs. Currently, there's about 60, maybe 80 of them, but the big difference is basically the collar height and the actual post height, the abutment height is what we call that post height. 
And so that's why there's a lot of vari um, you know, variability with the number is mainly because of the size, collar height, cuff height, and then the post height. But this is really, really cool that we can take a custom abutment type geometry and mimic it in an anatomical type abutment because of the turnaround time, the cost, all of these special savings. We're gonna jump into all of that. But what we don't want you to think is these are just stock abutments. These are designed thoughtfully from data from true custom abutments. And, and, and then just, just uh, the icing on the cake is my goal in this digital world we're all growing with and learning with is to not take out the abutment from primary insertion. That's my goal. It doesn't always happen. And then when it doesn't happen, before the end of this webinar, I'll share with you how you can get some magic happening when you have to take it out. But I'm thrilled that we have something that we don't. And, and I've, I, I, this isn't new. I saw it. I've been practicing this way for a long time. I, I, I understand it, but I'm thrilled now it's been, um, what would you say? Uh, we, we've been able to make it available for everybody and, and very uh, easy uh, at the same process. So when you think abutment, you don't think of biologic with uh, all of this attachment, all of this biology, but, but truly it's all about that. It's not about just a piece of titanium that has some con, you know, configurations that, that are symbolic of the tissue. It is very, very important to the outcome and the longevity of your case. And I've been doing this a long time. And I tell you, it's important. This is super important. And you guys that are, you know, five, 10 years into this, don't, don't appreciate the stability of good tissue and good bone and good occlusion. Because if you don't, you've got broken implants. You've got, you've got a, a bone that's blown out, no buckle plate. You've got a dehiss tissue. You've got a big fat mess is what you've got. And these patients, we have to live with them for a long time. So super exciting topic tonight. Um, Riley, let's get into it. So um, we touched on this just a little bit. And I just want to compare, I guess, these different categories. We have a stock abutment, a custom abutment, and an anatomical abutment. The anatomical abutment is a great kind of hybrid abutment, if you will, between a custom and a stock. So some of the advantages of a custom abutment the anatomical has and the advantages of a stock abutment it has. So first category here is fabrication time. One downside with custom abutments is obviously it takes time to make them. And with anatomical abutments, we have a large inventory of them. I was at the lab today and I uh, went there specifically just to look at our inventory levels. And we have hundreds and hundreds of these just sitting on a shelf, which means faster turnaround time. Um, just ease of use is really, really nice. Library based. What I love about library based is the geometries of these anatomical abutments is known. And it is actually library and categorized within our planning software. Um, in addition to our planning software, also our CAD software. And so we have the ability to play in the mouth scanning and then also understand that geometry within the software. Essentially what I'm saying is it's a scan body because it is library based. It is a scan body, which is the last category on the left. Um, but because it is a scan body, we can treat this like an impression coping as well, which is really nice to the point dad just made, which is, one abutment one time, this abutment can go in and does not need to be removed for an impression to be made. And so that's really slick. Is it customized to surrounding tissues? Yes, not as much as a true custom abutment, but certainly more than a stock abutment. And one really exciting thing is simply the cost. Because these are not custom made every time, but based off of custom abutment geometries, they can be mass produced, which means their cost can be greatly reduced. Um, and that's exciting to get some of the um, design features of a custom abutment at a stock abutment type price. And so that's really nice. And it's a fixed price. One thing about stock abutments, you can find a stock abutment for 60 bucks and also 260 bucks, depending on what type of stock abutment you might be looking at. These are a fixed price. You can count on it being the same time, uh, same price every time. Um, and it's a scan body like I talked about. So that's really, really exciting. So that's just a little comparison. Any thoughts there, Dad? Yeah, I think, and, and I, we're going to talk about it just a little bit more. But um, if you, well, actually, you know what? Let's go. Let's continue. I think I'm off on a tangent in my mind. There okay. you go. 
So let's talk about the actual abutment itself. This is what they look like. Um, I want to clarify some of these numberings on the very front. So there's going to be a letter and then two numbers. The letter is either an L, a U, a C, P, or M. Um, an L is for lower incisor, a U is for upper incisor, a C is for canine, P is for premolar, and M is for molar. The first number then is the actual cuff height, which is basically this area transmucosal. How thick is the tissue essentially is what that means. And so cuff height is going to either be two millimeters. I'll show you in a minute. There's a bunch of options for cuff height. And then the second number is the post height, which is this top part essentially here. And so it's a U25. This is a upper incisor with a two millimeter cuff height and a five millimeter post height. So if you had a bunch of these in your drawer and you're trying to figure out what is what, those numbers actually mean something to the clinician, not just to some manufacturing people. Um, another feature I want to mention, it does so, have- So I guess I've been doing it wrong. I thought the U meant universally could be put in any human that's under 25 years old. That is incorrect. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify, the U25 is a little different than what I was thinking. That's right. Okay, thank you. I, what, I'm, yeah. what, what did the M stand for in your mind then? Only for men? Yeah. Yeah, and C, <laughs> C only yeah. for Capricorns. Well, C was for Clarks. And oh. we read a lot of them. P was for just ordinary people. And M <laughs> was for, you know, kind of mentally deranged people. Okay. The, the number was just above the, the year or above, below it. So that's how I did it. But I, I'm learning a lot here. I'm with you. Perfect. Yes. So next is the lock groove. You see the little dimple on um, that far side there. There's a corresponding one on the other side. That just allows for different attachments to plug onto it, uh, mainly like a protective cap or there is a carrier that helps you seat these. So that's just for ergonomics. And then what's really nice, if you look at this top coating, this is kind of a polished metal down here. The top coating has um, been adapted with a different surface coating so that it's easier to scan. If you've scanned a lot of high metallics, you know that that can be a little bit tricky with our intraoral scanners. With that special surface there, it'll be a lot easier to scan. And that top surface is the most important in terms of the lab being able to overlay the data right. And so we want to make sure we capture that top surface just perfect. The bottom surface is important, but I had a meeting today with one of our lab techs and he told me that as long as we had 80% of the top of the scan adapter or this abutment, he said, I can work with it, even if you don't get the margin perfectly. And so that's why the top there has a different uh, surface on it. They come in a, um, obviously a wide, a narrow, and then a, uh, with a hex and then a non-hex as well. Now, one of, the, one of the beauties of that is obviously you can't get 100% gingival retraction. These are designed, hopefully, to be invisible to the human eye. And so they're under the tissue just slightly. So by having the anatomical uh, abutment be a scan body target, once the anatomy of the top part is dialed in, uh, from optical scans, then the other that is already in the library is, is a given. So no retractions necessary. So that's a very, very good way to go. We have had a couple of uh, doctors recently have issues where they ordered a custom abutment and thought it was a scan body. You follow? That, that's a problem. It's, it's a digital abutment that's the scan body. Your custom abutment can be scanned but again, it's, it's the metallic issue again. You could reprep it if you needed to, maybe frost it up a little like you would with a E4D or a, a CEREC and, and get an okay, but that's, that's a whole different ball game. So the anatomic abutment is a digital target, not a custom abutment. A custom abutment is custom, but it doesn't have the optical uh, sophistication that this does. I Perfect. think that what you've said with the top being frosted allows for a very great uh, visualization of it optically with the scanners. That's right. Okay, let me, uh, 
just highlight a couple other things here within this software um, or with, within this uh, abutment here. So what you're seeing here is the different geometries. Again, you're seeing the cuff height options and post height options. Basically it's a four or it's a five height. Um, and then the cuff height goes anywhere from one five to five five. So um, I, we lied to you just a little bit. That U25 number, when that first number is two, it's actually a 2.5. They just don't let you put um, um, all those different numbers on there. And so when it's a two, it's actually a two five. So do, do know that these charts are, are important. Um, the reality is you probably are not worrying about these numbers. You're probably sending a case to the lab and they are the ones that are worrying about these different numbers. So if this is a little, you're freaking out that you have to memorize, memorize all these numbers, you actually don't. We're just gonna send you the right one. But I think it's important that we understand, you know, what, what our options are. Now, Riley, there's an important concept here. Uh, what you said is so true. A lot of us are just letting the planners plan it for us and we're getting this uh, anatomical abutment back in our package for when we put our implant in and we're gonna put a temporary on it and all of that stuff. I would say, make sure you doctors pay a, a lot of attention. You know the patient better than the planner. If the tissues are really thick, if the tissues have robust biotype, or oppositely, they have translucent, wimpy tissue, that cuff height is gonna make or break your case, for sure. So if you've got great biotype and you love 2.5, go for it. If you've got delicate biotype and you're kind of thinking about 2.5, do 1.5. You will never go wrong by being a little bit more short with your cuff. And, and uh, a lot of you are saying, I get it, because the facial's your nemesis. The facial's your nemesis. Everything else will be great, and then you see a little part of that gray through a biotype, or heaven forbid, you see it above the gum. And I've been around the block, I get it, that happens. But be very, very uh, savvy in your planning. Don't let the planner do everything for you. Uh, it, you know, do it. Make sure you look at it and you have that I would, I would start uh, looking at your biotypes and having a one, two, three, or four type thing in your chart because you can't remember all this stuff. One would be the best, four is scary, and then make decisions with your planners according to the biotype. So again, these are the size options here, something you're not necessarily going to have to worry about, but you should provide some insight just like PK mentioned, and that will help um, you know, your outcome be what you want it to be. On the posteriors, they go as high as seven millimeters tall. Um, so there are different options there. So again, if you saw one that said M47, then that would mean it's a molar. It has a four and a half millimeter cuff height and the post is seven millimeters tall. And so if you were an office that was going to inventory these, then you're gonna wanna be familiar with all of those numbers. So that's kind of the anatomy of this abutment, if you will, and some of the different options that come with it. Um, Tom, you asked a great question about, you know, whether it's a custom abutment or an anatomical abutment, how do you go about getting an ISQ value without taking that thing off? That is a workaround that we are trying to figure out currently. Um, I'm hopeful that we can develop some different ISQ technology that can resonate off of these very abutments, or perhaps some type of ISQ peg that snaps onto these abutments. That is something that we're hoping to work with and find a solution to because once the abutment goes in to the point we've been making, we'd like to not take it out. And if you had to take it out to ISQ it, that's, that's unfortunate. That's disruptive to our one abutment, one time concept. I, I have used ISQs that you just uh, get, it, get it, the machine close to the, to the abutment, but they're not very accurate. You know, they're not like a Penguin or an Austell, some high, high end machine. But that is, that is the, the challenge with leaving it in. But if you've got a good ISQ at the uh, end of surgery and you did bone looks really good, I think, I think overall that's a downside. I hope, Riley, we find an ISQ that we can just resonate the abutment without taking it out sooner than later. Yeah, and I, th I think we're going to figure something out. My mm -hmm. advice would be just kind of like what you're saying. If tissue looks beautiful, if the bone looks beautiful, I don't think I would risk taking an abutment out just to confirm what you probably already know. You might choose to skip that ISQ 
Um, but you know, certainly the ISQ is fantastic when you're trying to go a little faster than maybe you think you normally could. If something looks a little suspicious, if the patient's health history is less than ideal, it's great having that numerical data. But sometimes it's just a home run case you can tell. And I've, I've skipped the ISQ once or twice just because you know, I feel like this is awesome. And I don't want to risk taking that abutment out. So let me come clean. Let's say you, you feel like you're compelled to take it out. You take it out. It'll bleed. Why did it bleed? Because you had fibrotic adhesions that you tore. It didn't bleed because it was inflamed. It bled because the fibrotic adhesions were torn. Be clear on that. Now, you put it back in. Make sure anytime you take a custom abutment, a healing abutment, anything out, you immediately take a cotton two by two with alcohol on it and get rid of the biofilm. If you put it on for five minutes on your workbench, it's going to have a not only it's going to dry and have dry biofilm. Otherwise, you just have cravicular fluid on it. So make sure you're cleaning it really well as soon as it gets out. And that's your dental assistant's job. That's your, that's your mission tomorrow to tell your dental assistants about that new pearl you le learned tonight or maybe Monday. And then the next thing you do is do the ISQ and it's 75 and you go, dang, I, 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 but I feel better. I know it. Now you go ahead and take, numb the patient up, take a diamond burr and rough up those uh, tissues that uh, were now no longer attached, refreshen it up, make sure that's been sterile, put it back in, and you're probably back to where you were, or maybe, but it makes you feel a little better. But I, I have done that many, many times and have good luck with it. I uh, graciously give you that pearl and hope you use it often. I love that. So you're essentially recreating that surgical environment that once was when the abutment went in originally, which is a deepithelialized tissue which is going to be more likely to, you know, connect with these is what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Now, let's say that your abutment, you've been using it for a temporary and it's just grody in the transmucosal area. Take it out. Your alcohol is not going to do it. It's going to, it's going to sterilize the surface of your biofilm, but that biofilm in the cravicular fluid uh, is going to metabolically break down right? And it's going to cause some leaching or some, some uh, problems with the titanium. So when I have something that's been in a lot and I don't feel it's just adequate, I take a brownie or maybe even a red striper diamond and I go ahead in that transmucosal area with a high speed handpiece and I roughen it up with my loops. I can see it. it's like mowing grass where you've been. Then I alcohol it make sure it's clean. Then I put it in and my thought process is I'm mechanically debriding the areas that could be problematic by, by eradicating the potential propensity for accumulation of biofilm. Hmm. I like that. I, I personally- That was an interesting, hmm. Was hmm. that like a sarcastic, I get it, or wow, my dad's smart. No, that's smart. I don't know if I love the red striper idea though, because you might create, you're getting rid of that polished surface at that point. And I think the polished surface for you millennials seems like that's the magic utopia and i'm going to tell you it's not a stippled surface would be better the environment doesn't know it yet it just makes sense surface area surface area but you guys like everything shiny and ironed and all of that look what's in your hair it's weird look what's in my i mean I barely have hair <laughs> all right let's move on so here's a unique little huh. there you can get huh. these huh. <laughs> huh. All right, go on. These are little seating jigs. For the most part, you're going to be seating your anatomical abutments probably with a lab made temporary because that temporary is going to guide in the abutment. But if for some reason you were putting in an anatomical abutment by itself, you would use one of these um, carriers that goes on and you can actually screw the uh, abutment straight through it. Um, so that's just a little delivery system. The P here is denoting that's for a premolar. There would be a corresponding letter for the different abutment types. Now, so yes, and, and in addition to that, Riley, a lot of doctors have asked me, when you put your anatomic abutment after placing the implant through a guide immediately, how do you know if you're not gonna move the implant? And do you really tighten it to 30 Newton centimeters or 25 or 20 or whatever you know the, the diameter necessitates? And the answer is you put the custom abutment, the anatomic abutment into the PMMA temporary and hold it rigidly 
And because the hex of the abutment that you're holding in the temporary holds it, you won't turn the implant. And you can, in fact, right after you've immediately placed the implant into bone, you can put that to manufacture specifications of torque without any issue because you're mitigating the rotation by this little insertion thing you're seeing on your screen or the custom abutment for the same reason or custom temporary. I mean. Yeah, I agree completely. I personally don't like to torque the screw all the way down. I try to go about 20 Newton centimeters maybe at day of surgery. I think um, if it's a big case, multiple implant, sometimes I just hand tighten them as tight as I can. But on a single unit, I like 20 Newtons probably. Um, but I love that idea. You just hold that in there. If that abutment doesn't rotate, then the implant certainly won't rotate and you could torque it all the way down, which I think is completely fine. The only reason I don't like torquing it all the way down is if I'm gonna be removing the abutment for some unforeseen reason, I do not want to put a reverse force of about 30 Newtons on an implant if yep. it's week two, three, four, five after placement, because that probably will move your implant back. Yeah, so you have to be careful. A lot of you guys use the torque wrench so you can get it tight enough. I have to use it because I'm my fingers are so strong that I don't break the screws. <laughs> I woke up sarcastic this morning. Just bear uh, with me. It's Thursday night for crying out loud. Come on, some of you smile. Fair enough. Okay. All right, here's what that looks like, practically speaking. And then here's just another little comfort protective cap that can go on top of the anatomical abutment that just helps the tissue stay away. Um, for whatever reason, if you're taking off a temporary crown um, and maybe working chair side on a temporary for a few minutes, I would put the cap on just because tissue can change quickly. If a patient were to break a temporary and the abutment's in place, I would put one of these caps on so you don't get any tissue overgrowth um, on the margins themselves. So they're aesthetic white um, and it just hides that kind of metal little thing sticking up. But that's a nice little protective cap and it uses that lock again on the mesial and distal to kind of lock itself in. I well, find that it pretty yeah, if you've got a, a like a number 18 and you put an abutment in it and for whatever reason, you know, you don't put a temp on it, these are really nice because it keeps the edge of the tongue from finding a little corner. And those tongues just, you know, can get really sore that way. If you haven't got the digital workflow dialed, you could take a uh, old school analog um, Siltex matrix, roughen this up, and then put your crown anatomy perfectly to it and then pop it off because of the little locks, clean it up and pop it back on. And these will retain without cement. So there's no propensity for peri-implantitis because of sloppy cleanup. Yeah, it's like a little coping basically inside your temporary you're saying. Yeah, it is a coping within my temporary, but if it, you kind of feel like it kind of is, yes it is. I love it, <laughs> I love it. Yes, it's kind of like a coping within your temporary. <laughs> That's awesome, Riley. So how do you order these things? When you go to the uh, Dio Navi website and you're ordering um, your cases, you select your tooth number. There's an abutment drop down and you can choose to just have a healing abutment. You could choose to have a customized abutment or an anatomical abutment. This is where that happens. So if you're wondering, how do I get these? How do I order them? This is the spot. We put in parentheses scan body just to clarify, there's been some confusion that with some doctors that they thought the custom abutment they got could also be a scan body, and that's not the case. Only the anatomical abutment, sometimes referred to as a digital abutment, is actually the scan body. And so that's just a little highlight there of showing you exactly how you order it and trying to clarify um, the different abutment options that are available and what you can actually do with them. So that's how you get that, and again, the planners will pick out the abutment size and shape. Um, and then if you have any feedback, that certainly would be welcomed. This is what it looks like when the implant planners are planning. They will put some implants in and plan it. They will then from there drop these virtual abutments in place and look at how they mesh with the tissue. So if you look at my mouse down here on the bottom right, this brown line represents the soft tissue. And then this is obviously the contour of your abutment. Me personally, I would probably braise that up just a little bit. 
I think it might be a little bit deeper than I want. Certainly the bone would be in your way if you didn't profile it, but there's the profile drill that would profile that out of your way. But this is really neat that the planners can drop these in and then with that, they can evaluate the soft tissue and just drag and drop different sizes till they get just the perfect size. And to your point, Riley, we'll go back to where you were cursing that using the cursor. You have to look at that, doctors. Look at that and say, do I like that? Riley said, I think it looks a little bit uh, sub subgentable to me, but you know what you're going to be doing. Maybe there was going to be an alveoloplasty. Maybe there was going to be something done, but I don't think the average doctor's looking at these details because they don't know. They haven't done enough of them to really get it, but you're the, you're, you're the one that's going to dictate how that all works. So um, anyway, I, good point. I appreciate your uh, thoughtfulness in pointing that out. So just a couple of simple workflows here, and obviously these workflows can go about 30 different directions, but I think this is how I've tried to explain this to doctors. <clears throat> In a immediate temporary situation, box number one, you would place the implant, you would put in your anatomical abutment, and you would cement your temp abutment. I would probably cement with a temporary cement because of what the step two is after now, he yes now i want to i want to comment looks like his wi-fi might be slowing down on us for a second actually order a custom abutment that would be uh, in replace of the anatomic abutment. So, but 90% of the time, I'd say the anatomic abutment is going to do you well for onesies, twosies. Where do you get in trouble? Very complicated cross arch. You may need a custom abutment if you're planning on doing a roundhouse temporary at that time to get everything to draw just right. And that, would you agree with that, Riley? It's hard to read you from this distance. Yeah, sorry, you cut out for a second. So I just wanted to make sure I was following up with you. But you were saying that basically the anatomical abutment probably is the go-to for 90% of the cases, but sometimes a custom abutment is going to make trickier situations <clears throat> more manageable, you're saying? Yes. And, okay. and I, 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 my first goal, because I'm a conscious, financially, fiscally responsible, not really, but I try to be, uh, doctor, that economics of the case is important. So I always try to start with my anatomic abutment first. And if it doesn't work, uh, it's usually the buckle. Then I prep it. And I, I, I realize at that moment, it's no longer a optical target. It's a standard impression. Send it to the lab and get my Emacs or whatever. So I talk to them about the prepping of the abutment. And they say, if I can touch the bottom 20%, the more um, um, apical, if you will, and I can still use it as my scan body. Ah, so you, but you have to get the new margin that you've created in your scan. Or you're just going to use it as a scan body for a custom for something abutment else. for something else. And I'm too cheap. I make that the custom abutment intraorally and yep. then deal with it with just an, a regular STL or just a regular uh, polyether impression. Yep, close sure. straight kind of concept. But, but the point is, box one could be a digital abutment, well, anatomic abutment, which used to be called a digital abutment, but anatomic, sorry for saying that, and then it could be a custom abutment. The reason, again, between the choice is the complexity of the case. And I would not go with a custom abutment because it costs you more until you need to. And you might need to, but why not try to do it the more simple way? So you have your surgery, you put your abutment and your temporary on. In this case, we're talking anatomical abutment. After healing, they're going to come in. I would remove the temporary, clean up any extra cement on the abutment. You then can scan with an intraoral scanner the anatomical abutment, send the file to the lab. From there, what's really cool is the lab will actually take that data and they will line it up, matching it, knowing now exactly the implant position and the abutment position because it is a scan body. 
Now they've got some options to design the crown. They could use that exact same abutment that you have and just say, oh, it looks perfect. We'll design a final crown to fit that abutment. They might decide to use a different style of anatomical abutment based on tissue healing profile, or they might decide, hey, a custom abutment might make more sense. Now you as the doctor can certainly suggest and ask what you want, um, but you could also ask them, please evaluate and determine what might be better. But the point of this workflow diagram is just to show you there's options. That abutment that goes in could be your final abutment very well. You could also switch it out for a, a cousin, meaning a different design of anatomical abutment, or you just used it as the custom abutment and your impression post, essentially, and then a custom abutment that's on its, on its way. That's completely up to you and how the case presents. Riley, there's one, you know, you called box one, and then box two. Could I suggest there's a box 1.5? You could. I can, and I will. <laughs> Here it is. 1.5 is you love the temporary. You love the tissues. You love the contacts. You love everything. You just tell the lab, I want a zirconia in exactly the uh, geometries of the PMMA temp. And then you order it up, match the color, then take off the temp and put on the, the crown. So there is a 1.5 option. How often do you think that happens in your practice? One out of 20 cases. Yeah. And because I'm older, I get 1.2 out of 20 cases. Mm. No, but the point is there is a probability that this can be a final decision without a final impression. That was my point. Yep. Yeah, yeah, everything's known. So if they love it, you just say, yep, I'll take it again. Because nothing was hand done. It was all done on a computer, if you will. So it's a saved file. It's but, like, but, yeah, I tell it, I tell people it's like a printer. If you wanted to print something, let's say a PMMA is like printing a paper out in black ink. If you want in zirconia, that's just like printing it out again, but in colored ink. It's the yeah. same thing. We just open up the file and say, make it from a different material. But, but so uh, just for box two again, you take it off, you use it as a scan body, and your options are for them to make you a custom abutment, right? Really, for me, it's, it's two decisions at, at box two. Keep, this, keep, keep the anatomical abutment, make it work, and take a static impression of it or an STL kind of impression. Second option of box two is just take the digital impression and have them start, start from scratch with new, new abutment, new crown. You with it, yep. any addition to that? No, I agree completely. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of your workflow with there. I think the key is you understand it can be a scan body. There are different geometries and then you can do with it whatever you want, but that's kind of the anatomical workflow um that i think has like we've demonstrated in our dialogue some offshoots there could be some different criteria that that show up that you determine to do it a little different okay here's kind of a more straightforward situation let's say you put no temp on it it was either a one stage or a two stage doesn't make a difference in this example you're going to uncover isq it once you know the test result you can put in a scan body or an impression coping take an impression, the lab then will analyze it and they could send you an anatomical abutment or a custom abutment when they design the crown. Or let's say you had a bunch of anatomical abutments laying around, you could use that as your scan body and take an impression of that. Whether it fit the tissue or not, you might just use it for an impression post, basically. I'm not you're, suggesting you're, you buy in for that, but they could do that. And I think we're going to uh, stockpile these from time to time because we're going to want a custom abutment. We use the scan body to be the scanning transfer mechanism. Then it gets sterilized and it gets back in our fishing tackle box. And then we have those to use. And you're saying, which I uh, appreciate the personal clarification, that the frosting of the upper third of, or upper two thirds of it is more critical than margins because, and, and that, that could be your, your scan body, or you could buy the scan bodies that are uh, provided. 
but you've already got the, the anatomical abutment in your case purchasing, so it makes sense to use those. For sure. Yeah. I think the part that really excites us, if I go back to this slide, if you go back to the point that you made, you could do all of this, it could fit perfect. It might only happen five, 10, 15% of the time, but you might never need to take an impression and just ask for the exact same thing. Or what is cool is that scan body anatomical abutment stays in the whole time and they just design the final crown from it. That abutment never comes in and out. So if you follow this path and jump to the top, this I think is the workflow of choice that I'm going for that I'm hopeful to obtain because that allows the abutment to stay in one time every time. Um, and then by doing that, we, we you know, complement the tissues the economics are very favorable. I'm not using two abutments. I'm not even taking out an impression coping. I'm not taking things in and out. Just the chair time is very efficient. I mean, how long would it take to grab a rongier, pull the crown off, clean up some cement, scan it, put the crown back on and you're done. That was your final impression. I mean, that's pretty, pretty, um, that's pretty compelling. And so that's the workflow that is really exciting. Um, this is um, a different workflow, but certainly, um, certainly nice. You can get a stock priced abutment with some of the qualities of a custom abutment. Now go back one slide, Riley. Sometimes you guys are working on some super difficult fussy patients. You put on um, a bunch of implants in the aesthetic zone. The temporaries came out maybe a little bit generic for the patient and you. So you went ahead and modified them you gave them some contours, you, you, you opened up some uh, gingival, or gingival and incisive embrasures, whatever. Before you take off those temporaries, scan it or impress it. So the lab knows what you're thinking more towards ideal because all they've got is the geometries of the custom uh, temporaries they made, which may have been a little generic for your taste, do you follow? Then they can scan those, compare the two databases and see how much you actually reduce the height, how much you reduce the facial and that. And I found that to be helpful. Any thoughts there? No, I love that. I think that's great. Yeah. Okay, let me just show you, we've kind of reached our time limit. Let me show you just a couple of pictures um, that kind of highlight this. So here's a digital impression and you see floating here at the top is a um, scan body that is libraried. And they are going to line these two things up. And by lining them up, we now know the implant position and exactly where the abutments are. Does that make sense? So we're scanning this here. We know this matches this. We just need the two to overlay on top of each other. By getting the proper overlay, we know where the abutment is. Because we know where the abutment is, we know where the implant is. It's just the same principles of a transfer. It, this is a transfer impression still. But once we know that, then we can plan crowns and determine are these abutments ideal still? How does the tissue look relative to the abutment? So those are just a few pictures that kind of just give a visual, I guess, for what we've been talking about the last 10, 15 minutes in terms of the workflow. I just wanted to make sure people saw the process and what's happening on the other side in the lab phase on the computer screen phase. Because for me, when I understand what the lab is doing, it just gives me better confidence that I'm doing the right thing chair side because I know what the lab wants. So in a nutshell for me, why I'm so excited to connect with my starting comments, I don't have to take out anything from the body in a lot of the cases and I can preserve the biologic width and I can still get a final impression. We're still working on the ISQ thing. We'll figure it out. So that's the, the anatomical abutment. It's a new and evolving thing. We're making more of them um, as we get more databases to analyze. I think this is um, an interesting and exciting topic and it's evolving. You know, I think it's becoming more and more important. And so we hope this was helpful. There's been a lot of questions around it. And we hope that this video can help clarify some of the questions that have arised from it and just provide a little bit more clinical um, clarity for everyone. Any other closing thoughts, Dad? You know, um, I think we've said it. I probably talked too much, but I, I think uh, this is exciting stuff. A little bit new vocabulary for some of us, all of us. Uh, 
it, it's, you know, I feel like I've got like three quarters of my body in a digital world and like a quarter in the di uh, analog world. And we're just, we're moving slowly towards the full digital, but it takes time. Be patient. Um, I think for me, the biggest learning curve has been good STL acquisition. I, I really think it's an art and I think we have to pay a lot of attention. It's not a point in We might have lost him again. Um, want to thank everyone for your time for coming in and hope that you guys enjoyed everything. We are going to um, wrap this up. We, we appreciate, though, um, all of your, uh, your attention for coming in. So thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you guys have a wonderful evening. We hope everything's going well in your practices and in your lives. And uh, look forward to connecting with you again in the future. You guys take care.